today. Uh, we know everyone is busy and that your time is precious. We greatly appreciate your commitment to bringing earthquake early warning to Californians throughout. We do ask that board members who are participating virtually turn on their cameras during the duration of the meeting. We also ask that others attending virtually turn off their cameras. As a reminder, and you might have just heard, the meeting will be recorded. And as for public comment, uh, please note that there will be an opportunity for board member discussion and public comment after each agenda item, starting with the general program update. If you wish to make a statement, please let us know in the room or use the Q&A or raise hand feature on Zoom if you're attending virtually and the moderator will unmute you. Now start the roll call. So I'll start roll. When called, please take a second to introduce yourself or as the designee, individual or as the designee. And with the Secretary of the Natural Resources Agency. Brian Cash here for Secretary Wade Crowfoot. Secretary of California Health and Human Services. I believe she's on her way, so we'll, we'll circle back. Uh, Secretary of Transportation. Lori Pepper for uh, Secretary Omashakan. Thank you. Secretary of Business, Consumer Services, and Housing. Hi, good afternoon, Melinda Grant, Undersecretary. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Speaker of the Assembly appointee representing the interests of private businesses. Good afternoon, Lupita Sanchez Cornejo. I am with AT&T and I'm an appointee of Speaker Rendon. Thank you. Thank you. Senate Committee on Rules appointee representing county governments. Good afternoon, Jeff Tony, uh, San Diego County Office of Emergency Services for county government. Jeff, Chancellor of the California State University. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Jack Anderson. I'm with the uh, California State University Office of the Chancellor. President of the University of California. Hi, this is Amina Sefa uh, for President Michael Jake. And I'm sorry, I can't go on camera. I'm at the airport. No problem. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, and the governor's appointee representing the utilities industry. And as I mentioned, the secretary, the representative uh, for the Secretary of California Health and Human Services is on her way. We have a quorum. Thank you. Director Ward, would you like to provide any opening remarks? Thank you for attending. And thank you for those <clears throat> who are able to be here in person. And I hope that uh, for those of you who couldn't be here in person that we get to see you uh, in the near future. Your roles uh, are of great importance to ensure that our continued implementation and expansion of the earthquake early warning technology to save lives and infrastructure. And thanks to the continued support of Governor Gavin Newsom and the legislature, we've made additional headway with earthquake early warning technology and its system operations. However, we have a long way to go as you all know. Uh, to, especially to ensure that the technology reaches all Californians, industries, and organizations. For this re meet, reason, excuse me, we're meeting today to collaborate and to leverage all of our partnerships. A goal of the meeting is to ensure all board members have equal understanding and background of the earthquake early warning technology. And the purpose of the meeting is to inform the public of the system operations, development, and implementation that allow the board to utilize critical earthquake early warning entities and partners to fulfill the objectives of the system. We want to ensure that during the meeting, barriers and challenges are discussed to ensure problem solving and solutions to be able to further implement earthquake early warning technology and grow our partnerships. Since our last board meeting, we've had many very significant events, as you may already know. On December 20th, 2022, a magnitude 6.4 earthquake occurred just outside of Ferndale in Humboldt County. On New Year's Day, a magnitude 4.6 struck 
the same area, this time near Rio Dell. You will hear specifics today as to how the system performed during these and other earthquakes in California. But I wanna say that while the system operated as expected and was able to provide the greatest number of people an alert through the MyShake app for a single event thus far, we're aware of some of the limitations to the system. One of the limitations of earthquake early warning is that closer to the epicenter, there is less advanced warning that e EW can provide. <clears throat> In this case, Ferndale and Rio Dale were so close to the epicenter that some devices received the alert while the shaking was still continuing. We're working with our partners every day to make sure the system is operating at its full potential and constantly looking for ways to improve latency and identify gaps in detection of seismic activity. However, this system remains as an earthquake early warning detection mechanism. It does not allow us to predict when or where an earthquake will occur, but as millions of users have downloaded the MyShake app, it's evident that Californians recognize the significance of the potentially life-saving tool. In recent response to the Ferndale earthquake, Cal OES activated the State Operations Center. And by the time of the Rio Dell earthquake, the State Operations Center was operating concurrently with earthquake events and the severe winter storms. Through the SOC activation for the earthquake event on January 5th, it currently remains activated continually for the storms, monitoring the unprecedented amounts of snow received over the past few months as it begins to melt and the warmer temperatures we're now experiencing. On February 6, 2023, a significant 7.8 magnitude earthquake hit Southeast Turkey and the Northwest region of Syria, followed by thousands of aftershocks. Close to 18 million people were impacted by this disaster and 4.2 million people were left without homes. Nearly 50,000 buildings, including apartment buildings, schools, and hospitals, were left in ruins, too damaged to be able to be entered. This event raised questions as to California's preparedness for such an event. The U.S. Geological Survey and our own disaster planning unit at Cal OES have conducted studies and done extensive research to predict what a similar event, such as a magnitude 7.8 or even an 8.2 earthquake, would look like in the state. Our Southern California Catastrophic Earthquake Plan ensures that we continue to operate and immediately and effectively respond in the event of a catastrophic earthquake and work towards recovery. One major factor in the number of lives lost in Turkey earthquake was the structural damage. Thousands of buildings were reported to have collapsed in a wide area extending more than 200 miles. In California, building standards gratefully are significantly more strong. The USGS study, the ShakeOut Scenario 2008, led local officials to begin focusing on vulnerable structures and initiated various projects to update unretrofitted brick buildings, brick concrete buildings, and soft story apartment buildings. The ShakeOut Scenario also found numerous areas where mitigation efforts by state agencies, utilities, and privately owned owner and private owners have greatly reduced vulnerability. On Thursday, March 9, 2003, the, at the request of the governor's office and following the Turkey earthquake, the governor's office of emergency services ho hosted a cabinet level discussion exercise utilizing our catastrophic uh, Southern California plan. This exercise focused on roles and responsibilities of state agencies in catastrophic disasters, including the purpose and function of the Unified Coordination Group. Many of our secretaries and uh, department heads had never been through, uh, not only been through an earthquake, but had not been through an exercise, uh, the magnitude of what was described in that uh, cabinet level exercise. And it was amazing that, um, that what they got out of it, just in terms of the size and scope of what may happen, the exercise was facilitated by Christina Curry and our, our own Lori Nazira. And it was uh, so well received that I think we're on the hook now to do several more of those <laughs> events. So, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. 
But the exercise addressed questions such as what level of participation is expected from our, from our state agencies? You know, what direction for the leadership? How will we communicate with each other? How will they communicate with their own staff? Given that our hybrid workforce now being remote and in the office, traveling all over, how do you communicate with all of those people? And I could tell by the room during that time that quite frankly, um, uh, there were a lot of agency heads who hadn't even thought of those simple, simple conversations. So it was, it was wonderful uh, for us to actually get their attention uh, in such a profound way. But numerous uh, uh, agencies and departments, we led a, a, an insightful uh, discussion on a catastrophic earthquake with respect to each of their agencies, our collective role as leaders to be able to come together wherever we are, as remote as we may be, on um, satellite phones potentially, uh, to be able to start the uh, unified coordination group to get uh, priorities uh, from the governor and to be able to facilitate execution uh, to ensure that we respond and recover effectively. Uh, and it was, it was stressed to uh, all the agencies should perform the tabletop exercise over and over and over. And I think uh, Lori several times uh, to perform these exercises for these agencies uh, all across the state administration. It's just a great reminder, unfortunately, to see that that level of earthquake happen and such uh, devastation happen to so many people widespread. But it's just a reminder that uh, it's it's technology like this that can help us day in and day out. Um, but we've got some some work to do, and so I uh, I yield back. <laughs> Um, Lori Nijera, for those online, I um, I would like to actually welcome our new director since our last advisory board meeting, um, and you've uh, you've experienced a lot. <laughs> you were sworn in on December thirty first. On January first, we had an earthquake, we had a bomb cyclone, and that was followed by. I've heard different numbers, 14 to 19 different atmospheric rivers. And um, for those that are here in Mather, California, we have blue skies outside, a light breeze and a pleasant temperature. And that will probably last for a day, but um, we, <laughs> we definitely wanna welcome you as you chair this, this meeting and appreciate all of your words. Thank you, Director Ward, and thank you, Lori. Would any other advisory board members in the room or virtually like to make any opening remarks? Remember, if you are online, you may unmute yourself. Okay, we thank you and oh. No, there's somebody with that. Repeat to the floor is yours. Thank you, Derek. Lupita Sanchez Cornejo, representing the private sector. And I simply wanted to thank the entire team. Certainly the first quarter of the year, um, actually now a little bit more than that, has uh, we've seen quite a few challenges. It's been a very uh, welcoming to see the rain in our state and much needed, but certainly it's been a lot of work. And so I want to commend uh, the entire team and of course, welcome the director and appreciate your leadership, especially uh, you had to hit the ground running with such a, so many opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Any other opening remarks? Okay, we'll now move to the meeting minutes. There's a copy of the meeting minutes from the last meeting, which took place on November 3rd, 2022, and the packet you received yesterday. Both were made available electronically and in person. We will need to approve the meeting minutes from the last meeting as today we have a quorum. Please take a few minutes to review them and then we'll move to, to vote. Lupita moves approval. We have a second. Thank I'll you. Second. Uh, Sorry, second. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all those in favor? Aye. All right, motion Aye. passes. Aye. Okay. 
any opposed? All right, with that motion passes, we'll discuss the general program updates. As the earthquake early warning program manager, I will now provide the general program updates today. Next slide. In with the 2023 business plan, since our last meeting, we've developed a draft of the business plan, which is currently under review. We expect the plan to be released later this year. Uh, with respect to the 2023 special report for the legislature, uh, we've developed a draft special report for the California legislature that discusses the potential funding sources for the earthquake early warning system and evaluates the viability of each source. Some of the funding sources referenced include the state's general fund, as well as various hazard mitigation programs, such as FEMA's BRIC, Building Resilient Infrastructure in Communities. We expect this report to be released later this year as well. Lastly, I just wanna to touch upon implementation. I don't, I don't wanna to steal too much thunder from our presentations for today, but you can expect to learn about a few of the projects that have been in development since our last meeting. Next, I'd like to discuss more some of the recent earthquakes continuing to lead the country in emergency management and disaster preparedness for the ferndale earthquake the eew system provided advance notification to millions of californians before shaking started an estimated 3 million android users received the notification directly on their phone without needing an additional app because the state's partnership with google incorporates the technology on all android smartphones Additionally, alerts for the initial event were sent to 271,277 devices through the MyShake app. To date, this is the greatest number of people who have received an alert through the app for a single event. Since then, there have been a number of aftershocks. Mm. Since then, there have been a number of aftershocks, most notably on New Year's Day, magnitude 5.4 struck and March 21st, a 4.6 hit the area in the middle of the day. I'd also like to highlight a few other recent quakes that have tested the system. On Tuesday, April 4th, an earthquake with a preliminary magnitude of 4.5 shook the Bay Area on Tuesday afternoon before 3.30 p.m. According to USGS, the quake was centered near the town of Trace Pinos in San Benito County, about seven miles south of Hollister. This quake initially registered at a 4.6 magnitude and triggered EEW alerts to 10,465 devices via the MyShake app and 115,000 Android alerts. On the 11th, a series of earthquakes was reported late in the geysers in Sonoma and Lake Counties, including a preliminary 4.4 magnitude timbler in Cobb. According to USGS, the magnitude 4.4 earthquake hit at 10.39 p.m. There were no reports of injuries or damage, according to firefighters. And of course, the geysers is an, an area known for a lot of geothermal activity as dozens of other small earthquakes were reported in the area that same day. This initially registered as a 4.5, which triggered an EEW alert that reached 21,855 devices via the MyShake app and 116,000 Android alerts. Now move to highlight some of the most more recent action items raised by the board in previous meetings and provide insight to what we've done or are in the process of creating to address the advisement of the board. In with outreach, members of the advisory board recommended conducting outreach in person at the various CSU campuses as face-to-face -face outreach is encouraged and is preferred by students developing a toolkit and outreach package specifically for educational institutions such as UCs and CSUs that not only educate students, but also conduct research. This could allow some types of EEW applications and mitigation strategies to be written and funded into grants. Ensuring outreach targets both English and Spanish news media outlets to reach a wider audience and help increase awareness of earthquake safety and encourage emergency preparedness and use of the MyShake app. Conducting outreach more throughout the year, there's a lot of focus on the EEW during the great shakeout in October. However, more focus needs to be brought to the program year round. Our, our response or in what we've been up to, including this great shakeout from October, 2022, we've increased our education outreach efforts 
This is in large part due to being close to fully staffed. We have strategically selected events which span from UCs and CSUs, such as UCLA and Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, to emergency preparedness events throughout the state. Our handouts are available in multiple languages. And additionally, we have begun the creation of sector and industry-based toolkits aimed to empower industry decision makers with useful tools, to educate their audience on EEW and implementation of automated protective actions. Another action item is tied to government facilities. Members of the advisory board recommend leading by example and implementing EEW in more government facilities, such as Cal OES headquarters. If it is not implemented in high level state buildings, other facilities are likely to decide against implementation. These buildings garner more media attention and can highlight the importance of EEW, encouraging others to act. Board members further recommend expanding the advisory board now that EEW implementation discussions have moved to government ops or DGS. Response, uh, you'll hear more during our R&D section about our efforts with respect to implementation in government facilities, beginning with Cal OES. That effort includes EEW display monitors, alerts, and the development of a MyShake desktop application. And additionally, we are exploring the pathway for inclusion of an additional board member. The last uh, action item we'll discuss today, uh, it pertains to visuals. Members of the advisory board recommend providing success stories and visuals that would show what EEW implementation would look like in areas that has not been implemented, such as on campus or stadiums, et cetera. And in response, uh, since the last meeting, we've been hard at work with the production of several success story videos that highlight the successful implementation and useful tools that assisted. These videos range from hospitals and condominiums to a spotlight on the MyShake tool. With that, uh, Director Ward, would you like to provide any comments? Do any board members wish to ask a question or provide comment in the room or virtually? If you are a board member online, please unmute yourself at this time. Please note we have provided a discussion question to spark, and we will be providing discussion questions uh, to spark conversation, but the board may raise any questions or comments related to the subject. We have a hand online. Public comment is now open. All comments will be limited to three minutes per person. Should you like to comment, please indicate so in the Q&A section or by utilizing the raise hand function of the video conference and the moderator will unmute you. With that said, we'll move into research and development updates, which will open with an update on data casting presented by David Lowe, who's the president of KVIE and the treasurer for the California Public Television System, along with our EEW research and development lead, Megan Sullivan. Play, please. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm sure a lot of you are wondering, so what is data casting? Data casting is an alert mechanism that borrows a small fraction of the total data flow of a digital TV station without having any effect on the programming seen by the public. Special receivers allow designated recipients to extract detailed alert data from the over-the-air signal. For California, data casting began in 2016 when a Federal Communications Commission inquiry into the suitability of existing federal alerting systems, such as IPAWS and WIA, and determined that no existing alert delivery technology could meet the criterion of a three-second maximum delay, also known as latency, in delivering an earthquake alert. Soon after, in partnership with American Public Television Stations, also known as APTS, and support from the Corporation of Public Broadcasting and donated equipment from manufacturers, KVIE in Sacramento conducted an experiment to determine the possibility of such low latency data casting of alerts. That field trial was very successful and demonstrated that data casting technology distributed on a TV over the air signal could send an alert in one to two seconds from receiving the USGS signal and led directly to a pilot implementation project for some of the state's metropolitan areas. 
Next slide, please. Palo OES partnered with APTS to begin the pilot implementation project or phase one of data casting. Five California public television broadcast stations were included in a pilot project to prove the feasibility of providing an alert to the general public in under three seconds. These five stations were located in Sacramento, San Francisco, Fresno, Southern California and areas of Los Angeles and Orange County and San Diego and service approximately 32 million Californians. Cal OES provided a grant of 170,000 to APTS to purchase data casting transmission hardware for the five stations, receivers for demonstration and pilot deployment, interface data casting software with USGS alerts and provide travel, travel, labor, materials and equipment necessary to provide services in accordance with the statement of work. For this partnership, APTS served as the holder of the pilot license agreement, also known as PLA. And now I will turn it over to David Lowe, president of KVIE and treasurer of California Public Television or CPT to talk about how data casting has been implemented in the state of California and future implementation plans. Thank you, Megan. And thanks for having me here today to be able to provide an update on the California Public Television Data Casting Project for Early Earthquake Warnings and Other Public Safety Communication and Actions. One thing I wanna emphasize for this presentation is this, take what you know about television and us as PBS and set it aside. I know, I know we're PBS and you're probably thinking Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, Sesame Street, Antiques Roadshow, uh, Finding Your Roots, but everything I'm gonna tell you about right now while using the television broadcast spectrum doesn't have anything to do with the television screen at your home. At least yet, we can actually do that in the future, but that's, that's for another presentation. Next slide, please. Our data casting system was designed to provide the fastest response technically possible once an earthquake is detected by USGS sensors. When quaking is detected, sensors send a signal to all PBS stations and those signals are then transmitted over the air. Receivers that exist today and will be built in the future are location aware. And if the earthquake is in its area, the appropriate alert and event actions are made. Right now it's an audible alert, but event actions can be programmed that automatically enact events that will help various industries and people in case of an earthquake. So in the example here, you can see that in addition to our technology, wireless emergency alerts are also provided through cellular carriers. There are a number of ways that these alerts can be sent and received. When we're dealing with public safety issues like this, the more ways there are, the better. Next slide, please. So I mentioned there are a number of ways. Uh, there's cellular, there's radio, there's television spectrum that can all be used. But some of the reason it's important that television spectrum is used is how the technology works. Our towers are what we call high power, high tower. Rather than relying on a series of transmitters and antennas, most of the signals come from one transmission point that is less likely to be taken offline in the event of a natural or man-made disaster. These transmitters have also been hardened by FEMA as part of the national alerting system through generators that will help the signal keep going if the power goes out. The spectrum we use is also more powerful in terms of how much data can be sent and how fast it is sent. And there's no congestion. It's a one-way delivery system that does not slow down based on how many people are receiving the signal. It's what we call a one-to-many transmission as opposed to a one-to-one. -one. And technically it's a one-to-infinite. No matter how many people are receiving the signal, it's just as fast as if only one person were receiving all the bandwidth. The signal also allows for more data to be throughput per second. In instances where maps or video feeds need to be provided, our spectrum is superior. As we look forward into the future, this technology and infrastructure can also be used for other emergency purposes. Think active threat incidents, other natural disasters, and more. We have had too many instances of modern day Paul Revere rides where sheriffs on bullhorns are going neighborhood to neighborhood for public alerting. Data casting helps solve this issue. And as new technology for sending out our signal called ATSC3 comes out, reception will be even better and devices that are powered off can actually be awakened with a special signal to ensure that emergency information is received. I mentioned in the future, the television, yes, it can actually turn on your television that you have off that says an earthquake is coming. All right, next slide, please. So I've been asked before what someone could do with just a few seconds of notice prior to an earthquake. And the answers are pretty incredible and have a number of different uses based on industry. Alerts can be sent to key employees who need to be activated. 
Fire station doors can be automatically open so they're not shaken out of their frames, trapping the emergency vehicles behind. Open doors mean firefighters can get out and be the first responders people count on them to be. Electric pro providers can shut down transmission lines and begin shutting down power generating facilities. This could stop blackouts. This could stop them from losing too much of their equipment in terms of a failure. Water treatment facilities, they can prevent water contamination by shutting down facilities. Mass transit trains and buses can be slowed or stopped. Oil and gas refineries can reduce the pressure in their pipes. Manufacturing facilities can protect their equipment by slowing and stopping processes. In healthcare, a surgeon can be alerted to not begin a procedure or even suspend it. Patients can be warned to move out to safer areas or even just be alerted to cover themselves in case of falling debris. So think of something like a skilled nursing facility where someone would actually have the time through a light that comes on and they know cover up, put a pillow over me so at least the ceiling doesn't uh, hurt me on the bed. Teachers can be alerted to move their students away from buildings or at least get under the desks. The options are pretty much limitless. Next slide. So I'm gonna show you two real world examples. And the first is Santa Rosa from September. And you're gonna see that the USGS alert was issued four and a half seconds after the event began. Alerts were received and they were delivered before shaking reached that perimeter. If you go to the next slide, this timeline shows that those USGS alerts and when they were delivered through our data casting. That first alert after originating four and a half seconds after the event was received about a second later and then delivered under two seconds. You see the fast delivery all seven times that the USGS alerts were received. Each USGS alert contained whatever known information there was at that time. They reflect any changes that became known like the estimated intensity or the affected area. And as I mentioned already, the alerts were received before the peak shaking reached the edge of the affected area. Now to the most recent example that we have, and Dr. Ward, you've already mentioned it, it's Ferndale. Next slide, please. And once again, um, we performed here, the USGS alert was issued four and a half seconds after the origin. And the next slide will show you the multiple instances, 13 times where those alerts were sent and received and our delivery again was made in under two seconds each time. This is another example that in the future when receivers are deployed and set up for the uses I mentioned earlier, Californians will be better prepared when the big one hits. And last slide. So with phase one, we already cover most of California's 32 million people, uh, but there are still some more areas that need to be covered. As you can see, we're missing the North state and then uh, some areas down South and then over into Tahoe, Truckee, you know, a lot of remote areas where people are still vulnerable. Uh, part of the spectrum that needs to be covered is by KNPB in Reno. The spectrum does not recognize our state boundaries, uh, but it does receive the signal from the translators that KNPB feeds, and those are in California, and they are important to be able to serve the residents in Tahoe, Truckee, in Susanville, and Lake Almanor. Once we're at full deployment, our system will serve over 34 million Californians with an early earthquake warnings and eventually can evolve into a multi-use emergency response and communications network. And that's it from me and my time. Thank you for allowing us to present our update on data casting from California Public Television. All right, so I will just talk briefly on phase two, what Cal OES is doing with APTS. Um, so as David mentioned, phase two will build upon the established network of existing high power over the air data capable transmitters. Um, and this is being done through a $500,000 grant from Cal OES that will allow APTS and CPT to equip the six additional public television stations in California. Um, the equipment that will be purchased will continue to receive alerts from the USGS and Cal OES over secure network connections. Um, special receivers will also be purchased to be deployed at various locations in the participating stations, coverage areas to provide output in various forms, including control switch signals, text, audio, and video. So APTS and CPT will be going through the PLA process 
and Cal OES will be joining along to understand the PLA process better and be able to support other organizations that may be interested in going through the process. All right, I'll just verbally say it. Um, so we have a discussion question. Um, so data casting has real world applications within all sectors included in EEW implementation. What areas within your sector would benefit the most from data casting? Thank you, Megan. Thank you, David. Oh, open for discussion. Uh, again, we have a discussion question to drive conversation, but we open it to the board members to take it wherever you all would like to discuss. Uh, Director Ward, would you like to open with any comments? Coverage is so widespread. So with this new grant, uh, how long, what would be left, I guess, for California after the second round of equipment is installed? With this, we're going to be able to onboard the remaining stations. So right now we're all all the existing ones are sending out those alerts, but obviously if there's no one, you know, there's no receiver in that area, then it's not going to help. So we'll be able to onboard the rest of the stations. And then what needs to happen is it's kind of a chicken and egg, you know, that the industry needs to get up to speed and, and get these receivers out there. And then people need to program for them. And like I said, you know, at use at utility providers, wherever, someone needs to be able to put that code in there that says, if I receive this alert, instead of just popping up a light, go ahead and you know, run this action. But we think that if it's out there, the industry will respond. Oh, I agree with that too. Thank you. Can you talk to us a little bit about these um, receivers and will they always be necessary or is the television uh, industry, you know, making headway towards implementing it or, um, right into every TV that's built. There's actually, in uh, John McCoskey, I think is online and he can provide some um, color commentary on this as well. But, you know, the televisions is one thing, but it's gonna have a receiver and what a television is gonna do is gonna be able to put up an alert. It might put up a map, it might put up a notice, but what we're talking about is something that's different from television. It's using the airwaves and it's going to, you know, touch a receiver like this that then is pre-programmed to run an automated event. So again, you know, the earthquake warning comes, this is at a fire station, it's received and it automatically rolls up those doors and they're out. Um, television sets are a little bit of a different receiver. So we don't really see this as the television industry. This is more the public alerting and safety industry. Uh, hi, David, this, this, this is John McCoskey. I, I think you did mention though, that uh, as television evolves to the next generation of digital television, it's called either next gen TV or ATSC three, there will be ways to actually uh, reach out to televisions that can display the alert. And as David said, even, even wake up um, if they are uh, within an alert area. So that's something that's evolving. Um, that'll probably happen over the next five, five plus years in California. Or smart TVs are going to get smarter. They'll, they'll definitely get smarter. <laughs> and I'm, can I take John everywhere I go? That was fascinating. Like anything I can't fully answer, I'm now going to have a voice come and go, <laughs> well, actually, it's this as well. I have another question. So um, what are the costs to the industries for the receiver? And is there a reoccurring cost? Sure. So John, this one is for you. John is involved in this, obviously, you know, just like computers and cell phones, technology needs to be refreshed uh, at time, but you know, the entry level cost is pretty low, John. Sure, so uh, it, for those of you who can see this, I'm gonna hold up a, what a consumer receiver looks like today. So it's a little box, you know, about the size of a deck of cards. These are purchasable now online uh, from one company for, for two of them for uh, $299. We think that price is going to come down quite a bit as the volume goes up for these um, and makes it more affordable. 
for for commercial applications, the receiver is going to look more like a set top box that actually has a network interface on it, and is is uh, as David said, is set up to talk to automation systems like uh, process control and things like that. These we expect to be in the range of of about five hundred dollars for a receiver. And then, as David said, there will have to be um, some work on the other side of the automation systems to actually program these in. But they use industry standard uh, automation techniques to do that. And there is no there's no uh, ongoing service charge or monthly fee or anything like that. Um, this is this is something that uh, California Public Television is providing as a service to the state. And, and I should add, a lot of this has to do with the software that needs to be developed. Anything that can handle receiving a television signal, an over-the-air signal, could then be used. If the uh, cell phone manufacturers were to put a TV antenna inside of the phone, which is uh, technically possible, they've not done it yet, but if they did that, that would be a receiver for purposes like this. All right, uh, we'll now open up discussion to the board members. Uh, again, if you would like to speak, please unmute yourself now or raise your hand, use the Q&A feature. All right, Jack, got your hand up. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I do have a question in terms of tower ownership. Does the public television stations own the towers or are they renting the tower renting space on the towers and my second question is um what is the co building code risk category designed for those towers are they designed for emergency communications or are they just are they um designed more for just general broadcasts so we have a saying that if you've seen one PBS station, you've seen one PBS station. Uh, we're, we're all different. And you know, some of us have our own towers, some of us lease space on towers. But as I mentioned before, these towers are hardened by FEMA. Um, they, they are, you know, I, I don't know what the building code is, but you know, maybe John knows, it's a little bit more of his background, but these are hardened. Um, these are some of the, you know, the strongest towers that exist anywhere. Yeah, David, I'll, I'll only add that it, that the broadcast towers, because they are so tall and so big and so heavy, um, they survive pretty much everything. You know, if you look at, uh, at Japan as an example, when they had their, their major earthquake, I think in 2011, not a single one of their broadcast television towers uh, came down. One of them was slightly damaged, but was still operational through that. So the, these are towers that are built to to survive major uh, natural disasters. All right, uh, board member Lori Pepper. Thank you. Um, as you guys were talking, I started um, basically brainstorming um, about some of the issues with the uh, departments that that we oversee. Um, but I started thinking, so is this um, is data casting, and I apologize if I, I missed this, but data casting, I mean this in a positive way, a redundant system on top of um, kind of our our cellular uh, my shake alerts and and that stuff like that we could implement at the same time. Yeah, again, I think, you know, John can come back in, but it, it is a redundant system. And again, as I mentioned, kind of more is more. So let's say the cell networks um, drop out, a cell tower goes down, then our system is still up, but they could also be used for different purposes at the same time. So uh, I mentioned that video will go through faster with the television spectrum. So let's say there is a, um, a, a an active threat situation and people need to see a live video of what's going on inside, or they need to push um, building plans through that would be better used through our spectrum and, and that would keep the other spectrum open for maybe other communication, emergency communication purposes. Great, I think um, one thing I would like to put out there um, at the appropriate time, I think when we're talking about um, you know, the receivers, whether they're personal or commercial, you know, I'm thinking about DMV field offices and the bar pilots and our TMCs throughout the entire state 
that um, we may want to consider um, creating a master services agreement for all of us to purchase off of how um, easy the procurement process is. So anything we can do to, to make that better and then hopefully install. Okay, uh, do we have any more? All right, uh, Jeff. Quick, quick technical question along the same line. So this bypasses the iPod system. So does it go direct from the USGS sensors to the towers themselves? Yeah, it, it goes directly to the station, which then has the encoder that then sends it out to the tower and it goes out. Got it. And I'm just thinking a potential use uh, being a coastal county, I always worry about the near, near source earthquakes and tsunami. Um, a lot of our lifeguard towers have the long range acoustic devices. So lifeguards can say, hey, there's a shark in the water. But to automate that to those speaker systems, especially if it's a lot quicker, um, I could see a potential use for a near source tsunami. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from the board? Okay, public comment is now open. All comments will be limited to three minutes per person. Should you like to comment, please indicate so in the Q&A section or by utilizing the raise hand function of the video conference and the moderator will unmute you. Okay, we will move to the... Oh. Okay, uh, we have Lana Thompson from APTS. Lana, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, um, I appreciate being able to attend this meeting and it's been really helpful and fascinating to um, see the process and learn more about the good work in California of all your services. I hope I'm not overstepping myself by speaking up, but I just wanted you to know that I'm on the call and very appreciative of the good work that Cal OES is doing on early earthquake warning. I am the um, executive vice president, COO and general counsel of APTS, who represent the public television stations around the country. And our California stations are doing such a great job uh, in this work. And this work, you know, as David said, it's not something that people think about when you think about public television. But our stations have been doing data casting with education and schools for many, many years and with public safety as well. Um, with the advent of analog to digital, we were able to increase those services. And, and as David and John said, with the advent of the current digital standard to the next IP based next gen TV standard, we'll be able to do even more. Um, but we're really pleased um, to be working with all of you and uh, kudos to our California stations and the Cal OES. Um, it's a, a really great project. And I just wanted to thank you all and um, for the opportunity to attend this meeting. Thanks. And thanks to you, Lana. Lana's been very instrumental in bringing all the people together on this project so that we have all the right people in the room. So we appreciate that. Thank you, Lana. Uh, any other public comments on the line? Hearing none, uh, we will move to the next item on the agenda where well, thank you, David, and thank you, Megan. Uh, we'll move to the next item on the agenda where we will, the EEW Research and Development Lead, Megan Sullivan, will present updates for the EEW sector-based implementation. She'll be joined by EEW Advisory Board Member Lori Pepper, who is the designee for the California State Transportation Agency, and Derek Cantor, who serves as the ESF-1 lead for Caltrans. Megan. Great. Hello, everyone again. So the earthquake early warning system is being used in a variety of ways in the state of California to facilitate earthquake risk reduction. To expand and diversify EEW technology with stakeholders, our program will focus on the integration and adoption of EEW automated actions. 
Cal OES is using a sector-based approach to leverage these successful implementations to expand the uptake of automated protective actions. Cal OES has identified key sectors, including local government, state agencies, and private industry partners to increase private sector system uptake. So as you can see on the screen, phase one consists of first responders, government facilities, transportation, and education. Phase two will focus on medical and utilities, and phase three will include telecommunications and businesses, such as private businesses, financial institutions, and factory and manufacturing plants. Next slide, please. So for Cal OES facilities implementation, we will be procuring TVs to be placed strategically across Cal OES facilities. These TVs will be equipped with EEW display to monitor earthquakes, as well as having data casting capability. In coordination with our UC Berkeley Seismology Lab team, we are working on getting a MyShake computer app first installed in our Cal OES facilities. The goal of implementing this app is to significantly increase the impact of the California Earthquake Early Warning System on public safety, as well as being able to broadcast alerts to the public within their infrastructures, such as education, water districts, and several others. We will be utilizing the existing MyShake infrastructure because MyShake already has a signed ShakeAlert LTO or license to operate, and an existing backend infrastructure to push EEW to millions of devices. The MyShake application would be extended to the delivery of alerts to new types of IT devices and operating systems, such as desktop or laptop computers. Cal OES also put out a request for information, also known as an RFI, to gain additional information on the capabilities that exist with implementing EEW and Cal OES facilities. This includes all the potential automated actions that could take place in each one of our facilities, including an EOC setting within our state operations center. We will be looking to seek proposals for the actual implementation of EEW within our facilities next fiscal year to be a leader in supporting EEW and other government facilities. Next slide, please. So first responders play a critical role in the aftermath of an earthquake, both helping those that are injured and limiting additional damage. Cal OES will be working with an LTO to assess, procure, install, and test EEW systems with automated actions within up to 35 local fire stations. Stations were identified based on their location within a seismically active area, history of catastrophic earthquake events, and the social vulnerability index of the area the station is located. Counties with identified fire stations include, but are not limited to, Humboldt County, Napa County, Alameda County, and several others. Lastly, we are collaborating with the Seismic Safety Commission and their fire station inventory survey based on the 1986 Essential Services Building Seismic Safety Act, stating that buildings providing essential services need to be designed and constructed to minimize fire hazards and to resist the forces generated by earthquakes. Next slide, please. So why is EEW technology and its automated actions important to fire stations? An example of the need of implementing EEW within fire station is shown in this article from the magnitude 6.4 Ferndale earthquake that occurred on December 20th, 2022. The Rio Del fire chief expressed how firefighters couldn't immediately respond to calls for help after the bay doors were jammed shut, leaving fire engines trapped inside. It took about 15 minutes to pry them open. However, this wasn't the first time Rio Del experienced this. In the 1992 quake, Rio Del Fire Department was initially delayed in responding to about 60 calls, including two fires because the garage doors were off the hinges and had to be pried open. Additionally, three decades ago, homes in nearby Petrolia burned because the firehouse garage door jammed and trapped the engines inside. Next slide, please. So the EE technology and equipment will use the USGS shake alert signal to expand the application of the California Earthquake Early Warning System throughout local fire stations in two critical areas. First, it will alert first responders and individuals working in the fire stations to take action to protect themselves with duck cover and hold on before shaking starts. Examples of this technology include PA systems, intercoms, alarms, uh, visual lights, audible alerts, and several other methods. Second, it will also take automated protective action by activating or ceasing critical processes before shaking starts to minimize injuries to people and reduce damage to property and infrastructure. Examples of this include activating the bay doors and opening gates to ensure fire engines can respond to calls, trigger automated backup systems for operations and communications, 
throttle valves for gas and water, de-energize electrical control panels, and slow and or stop moving people moving devices such as escalators and elevators. By installing earthquake early warning system within local fire stations, it will promote injury avoidance, improved emergency response, reduced response impediments, faster overall response and effectiveness, and enhanced situational awareness for local first responders. Next slide, please. Now moving on to airport implementation, I would like to introduce Lori Pepper with CalSTA. And um, so I think what we're seeing here, I was excited to see the um, fire station pilot be described because what I see, there's a lot of overlap in the types of functions that we want to automate, regardless of building, regardless of service. And so when it comes to the airports, we're going to be doing a lot of similar things. And I think the really exciting part is we can take some of those core functions after we test and perfect them and really um, replicate it throughout many different types of facilities, many different types of services. Um, and I think this is how we really perfect that core technology. And then I think we just kind of go and scale and replicate and expand. Um, and so uh, we were really excited when we got the call from OES to um, ask us to partner with them and help them um, figure out how to do an airport pilot. And I think we came up with some really great ideas that will then be able to be scaled throughout the state in airports. And I'm already looking beyond airports to um, the other functions that we oversee. So thank you so much. And I'll turn it back to Megan. Thank you so much, Lori. So after several planning sessions, it was determined by all partners and our research team at UC Berkeley that using a phased approach to the implementation of EEW within airports, um, starting with a feasibility study would be the best starting point. The assessment of the identified airports and the development of a feasibility study would identify the most appropriate technologies needed for each airport, the stakeholders that will need to be involved, and determine any requirements and all the necessary steps to efficiently and effectively implement EEW and applicable automated actions in each airport. After a feasibility study is conducted by our partners and research team, Cal OES will then move forward with the actual implementation of EEW within the identified airports of Los Angeles International Airport and Palm Springs International Airport. Next slide, please. Specifically, this feasibility study will explore several facets of implementing EEW within LAX and Palm Springs. The university and other stakeholders will conduct a walkthrough and assess the airports and provide a report on all the processes that need to take place in order to implement EEW. This includes providing a checklist of all the steps needed to take to implement EEW system, as well as its automated actions within each airport, including both the land and the air side of each airport. This will also include all the processes that may need to take place with outside stakeholders, as well as any required plans, licenses, special permits, or other hurdles that may be required to be in place. This could also include regulatory agencies that govern airports or, bureau or bureaucratic hurdles. It will also identify any technology needed, such as hardware or software, to install an earthquake early warning system within each airport. It will also include a summary of how the airport and passengers could be affected by the installation process. It will also identify different types of automated action capability within each airport, specify the capabilities of each location, and provide guidance on costs and technology needed to implement the automated actions, as well as integrating them with the earthquake early warning system. Additionally, the study will also explore the estimates of benefits, including statistical life savings and averted property damage from the EEW deployment, as well as identify deployment alternatives requiring different levels of investment and benefits. Lastly, it will also explore estimated costs for the implementation and the life cycle of an EEW system and its automated actions. This includes the cost of equipment and technology, installation costs, and a maintenance schedule with associated costs. Next slide, please. I will turn it over to Derek Cantor with Caltrans to run us through why we selected LAX and Palm Springs for the feasibility study. Good afternoon. So let's start with Palm Springs first. It, it, on the surface, it may not seem like an, an obvious choice, but at the same time, it sits right in the middle of 
San Andreas Fault System and the San Jacinto Fault. So in terms of getting UC Berkeley the greatest amount of data in the shortest amount of time, we looked for an, a, a commercial service airport. That's a, an airport with regularly scheduled passenger service that um, the equipment would read a lot of data. So we we're trying to get help Berkeley out, get as much information in as short a time as possible. Also, Palm Springs is very, very active um, in early earthquake warning. They've wanted to do this for a while. For them, this is a great opportunity to kickstart something they've been trying for a while. So in that part, it's it's great. Also, it's easy to get in and out of Palm Springs. You can get there from from anywhere, um, anywhere in the state. So getting the, the researchers there, getting the equipment in and out. Um, but it's also a busy airport, over 3 million passengers a year. So it's not exactly you know quiet by any standard, but at the same time, it's in a very geologically active area. And that that was of high priority for us. You know, LAX, obviously, you know, it sounds like a good place, but LAX is not as geologically active, but they've wanted to do this for quite some time as well. Their their program has had some starts and stops, and they said this is exactly what they need to take it to the next step. So they're absolutely on board with this. Also, LAX is is connecting or Metrolink is connecting to the terminal, just like BART goes into San Francisco International, LAX is doing the same thing. So this is one of those opportunities where we always think multimodal in, in the transportation world. It's anything we can do in the airport sector. If we can also expand that to the modal system, that's that's always gonna be in the, you know, in our best interest. And particularly in the in the high passenger areas, you know, San Diego International, they're doing the same thing right now. You know, the big build project, they're doing the, the same type of interaction. So we see this easily exportable to those. These are good airports to start with, but um, we definitely believe the data side of, of Palm Springs is going to be really valuable. Eric, next slide, please. All right, we have another discussion question for you. So how will you prioritize EEW implementation in the agencies and organizations within your sector? Thank you, Lori, Derek, and Megan. Uh, with that, we will now open for discussion. Director, would you like to provide any comments or questions? Debbie Hi, Barrett. Tina Curry, Cal, Cal OES. I have a question back to the airports. I think most of us can kind of imagine the types of things that EW could benefit airports, but I know even though we don't have the feasibility study yet, do you have some examples of likely um, uses? Would it be like stopping takeoffs because the runways might get damaged? I don't know. I'm just trying to imagine. What yeah, might so be. we'll be focusing on the land and the air side. Um, so obviously on the land side, we would be having um, the people moving devices. So like those moving walkways, elevators, escalators, things like that. Um, so similar capability that we would have in our Cal OES facilities. On the air side, um, I will defer to Jose and Derek. I think one of the things that, that is gonna be explored is obviously the uh, on the air side is air operations, right? You know, takeoffs, landings. Um, I think another one that is, you know, Kind of similar to what we see in some of the other implementations are the pipeline, major pipeline cutoffs. And that is critical um, to the redundancy and long-term continuity of operations for an airport, particularly when you're thinking of LAX. You know, once you cut off fuel, you're you're almost cutting off the airport. So that's a very um, specialized thing. And it's not just the major distributions, but it's also the the pot of or, or the point of distributions throughout the airport with the airport being as such as large as LAX. Um, you know, the air operations in particular will be um, probably a long term thing because of the complexities of the regulatory process that governs um, airports. But those are some of the implementation. Also add that some of the things we forget about the bigger commercial service airports is that there's a lot of facilities that are elevated the jet walk to go from a terminal to an airplane. Um, some of the baggage uh, claim areas, what have you. Um, anything that's elevated has a fall hazard, has a risk. So anything we can do to shut down certain things that would prevent 
um, the movement of anything that's elevated up on piles, piers, something on those lines. This would also be used in those type of things. The stuff on the ground, it tends not to fall very far and, and you're okay, but there's so many elevate. We forget about that side of, of Air Force, but there's an awful lot of elevated facilities that this would. Okay, and we'll open it up to the board members. Uh, you may unmute yourself now. And I think I see Jack. Yeah, so hi. Yours. Thank you. Um, so I did want to comment on your discussion question. Could you put that back up for a second, please? Like I'm speaking to it correctly. While it goes up, uh, how will you prioritize EEW implementation in the agencies and organizations within your sector? Yeah, for us, so the CSU. From, we have a seismic review board. We actually have a board system-wide. They're outside uh, structural engineers. And we have, uh, we have actually, because we're our own AHJ, we've, we are allowed to uh, take uh, actually in, uh, meet or exceed the code. Um, in some case, and for the, our seismic requirements, we have a, uh, a document, it's about 50 pages, and part of that is what's called the specular uh, ground motion coefficients. Uh, it's, a, it's coefficients that are actually in the building code. We actually modify those um, in relationship to data that we've collected at each, at surrounding each campus. It's a bit complex, but in essence, we would actually use that as a guidance. So for instance, we pretty much have campuses, you know, we can, we have 23 campuses. I can pretty much tell you from campus number one all the way to campus number uh, 23 of which campuses are our highest priority, which are, you know, basically on down the line to 23, which is the lowest priority. So we certainly have that information uh, for each campus. Great. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Brian, I believe you have your hand raised. Yeah, it's, I was curious if, um, you know, we have a lot within the Natural Resources Agency, we have a lot of emergency responders, CAL FIRE in particular, uh, who I was thinking of. And I was wondering if there, um, this is a question probably for OES, but if there was any funding available to help implement these within the like the cal fire stations and other emergency response yeah thanks for that question brian so we do actually have as part of the overall fire um, station implementation project that was discussed earlier we do have cal fire as one of the key partners and stakeholders that we hope to work with um, seeing as they have a pretty wide impact um, th throughout california so that is definitely somebody um, an agency that we'll be working with, and I'm sure we'll be reaching out to you for for assistance or for um, for support on that. That's great. Thank you. And uh, so, with that pilot, obviously, um, the there are grant funds through the Earthquake Early Warning Program to to implement. So that is like to buy equipment, etc. Um, there may be potential ongoing costs for um, the EEW signal that as part of our grant, we would not take on. So that's something that the agency needs to look at. Um, we, there are other grant funds that could potentially do the same, that, that, that could pay for the implementation or even I think um, the feasibility studies, et cetera, um, but not for the ongoing um, uh, service, if you will, for earthquake early warning. So, um, so it would be something that the agency needs to look at um, you could apply for like hazard mitigation grant program, the BRIC program, if you were doing more of a large scale across all or a, a huge portion of your um, facilities. Um, but then you also need to look at your budget for the ongoing costs. And we are happy to um, to sit with you and and or connect you with vendors so you can have those discussions and kind of get a better idea of what those costs would be. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Lori. Any other comments from the board? Lori. 
I just um, just wanted to add on to that. Um, so in a, a separate program, um, one of the things that we've done in order to help um, some of our industry partners is create a statewide master services agreement because then that actually increases the alternative race and we've been able to break costs down. So I don't know if maybe one strategy might be, that's why I was bringing up the procurement earlier, um, because if we all go individually, um, I think it could be um, a little bit more expensive than. We'll definitely follow up on that, um, Lori, because it is the concept makes total sense of scalability across the state, the procurement process for all government. Um, what, you know, so duly noted, we'll, we'll explore that um, coming up. Okay. With that, I believe we will move to public comment. At this point, we'll open up discussion for any public comment. All comments will be limited to three minutes per person. Should you like to comment, please indicate so in the Q&A section or by utilizing the raised hand function of the video conference and the moderator will unmute you. None. Uh, we will now transition to education and outreach, where we will hear from our partners from the United Way to discuss our recent outreach partnership, followed by Lori Najura, Cal OES's Planning, Preparedness, and Prevention Deputy Director, who will provide an overview of the EEW Quake Safe Cities and San Jose Quakes Ventures. Closing out the education and outreach portion will be our administrative, ad, excuse me, administrative analyst, Samantha Lane, to highlight a few of our recent events. That United Way, if you're ready, the floor is yours. Uh, and it may take a second for us to get the uh, slides up, so bear with us. No worries. Thank you uh, so much for having me this afternoon. Uh, kind of just starting off. So we are United Way, but underneath that is a subsidiary called Inland SoCal 211 Plus. So under United Way is also the 211 agency. Uh, within our region and our region really expands from Riverside border uh, of San Diego to the Imperial border all the way out to the Nevada and Arizona borders out there in Needles. So a very large area that we cover and then also some of the lower part of Los Angeles. So we cover a very large area. It was mentioned earlier uh, in this meeting about Palm Springs Airport that falls right within our service region. And as you can see, both the San Andreas and the San Jacinto fault lines kind of align up into there. So our service region covers quite a bit. We can go to the next slide there. Um, my name's Christopher Darby. I'm the Director of Data and Outreach for the organization. So the outreach for the MyShake app and early earthquake warning would kind of fall under my purview there. And so uh, that's primarily what this, this presentation is going to be about is 211's role within disaster preparedness, response, and recovery, as well as uh, our role within the MyShake app and that outreach for that program. So we can jump to the next slide. United Ways, sorry. There we go. So just to cover some of our mission. So our mission at United Way is to unite people, ideas, and resources to empower our community and improve lives. And we believe that the MyShake app falls right within that. We want to empower our community, especially with that early earthquake warnings uh, for those in our community. So uh, the promotion and education and outreach for the MyShake app uh, falls right within our mission. Our vision is also, um, we envision a caring community, an extraordinary place to live, learn, work, and grow. We work towards this vision by focusing on the education, financial stability, health, and housing of all people within the other inland Southern California region. And our values really fall within the three E's, which is equity, excellence, and empathy. Next slide, please. And so what is 2 on 1? This was a video that I was going to share with everyone, but I think we can't play it on the meeting today. So I'll just kind of explain what it is. So what 2 on 1 is, it's a health and human service line. And this is a PSA that would have played that's done by the Ad Council. You can look it up on YouTube 
Uh, and you can see it there. It's just a one minute commercial. If you watch uh, some late night television or early morning television, you might see this commercial as well. But really it's talking about two on one being the guiding light. And we really wanna guide people to resources that they need, uh, especially during times of disaster. And we also want to uh, just get people connected to health and social services within our, our two county region there. We can jump to the next slide. So this is our role within emergency preparedness response, and it should add recovery into there uh, because it's something we recently did. So one of the things, we'll talk more about the MyShake app, but that's one of the ways in which we wanna do preparedness and education and outreach on that. We're also a part of VOAD, which is those volunteer, volunteer organizations active during disaster. So we participate on both VOADs, both in Riverside County and San Bernardino County. And it's really, uh, just to get community-based organizations um, assisting during those times of disasters. And then we also work with Edison. I think PAG&E is a part of this program as well in the northern area. But this is just um, to get people in the access and functional need communities uh, connected, connected in care coordination in case power, uh, public safety power shutoffs do happen. So we work with them in creating a plan for if those uh, public safety power shutoffs happen, uh, and they create that plan for if that were to happen. And we also connect them to resources uh, in case that that power shutoff happens, and then getting them connected to that. We also do response. So what happens frequently with our our area is fires. So fires is one ways in which we we do a lot of response. So if a fire occurs, we get connected directly to our emergency departments in both counties, and they utilize the 211 number to be that information line for those. So it, it's to kind of get rid of some of that rumor control, uh, to get to get them connected to shelters, to get them connected to where they can take their pets. So they utilize 211 to direct them to us to call and they directly give us the information so that way we can provide it to the callers when they call in. But we also do um, just all those disasters. So one of the ones, uh, for example, is if you remember the North Shore kind of monsoon, kind of weird kind of weather they got that knocked down 14 power lines. So we were activated during that event where we were connecting people to where they can get ice, shelters, um, and just connecting them to those needed resources. And most recently, the Hemet fire, all of you may have heard of that one as well, uh, and connecting them to um, the shelters as well and letting them know which roads are closed and they would direct them to us. And re uh, most, most currently is we actually created a kind of recovery for those fires. So when someone, a fire does happen and somebody gets displaced or if they're is a fire and their house burns down and they need to go to a motel, we can reimburse them up to $300. So it's kind of an immediate need uh, to meet when those fires occur. Uh, and that is provided directly through a partner organization. And so we're able to provide with um, kind of assistance during those fires. We can jump to the next slide. Now let's jump into my shake and what it was and what it means to this group here. So. Uh, early in 2021, we were approached to do engagements with 70,000 Riverside County residents. And the goal was to connect them and educate them on the MyShake app and early, early earthquake warning. Um, and we were gonna do it primarily through two ways. We were gonna do it through the phone engagement to 211. That's why I explained a little bit of what 211 was and as well as community outreach events. So we were out in the community. We were also doing phone engagements over the phone. What that would look like is they would call in the 211 and we want to educate them and make sure that they're prepared for uh, an emergency or an earthquake. And if an earthquake were um, to occur, were they ready for it? And if they said no, we wanted to follow up with them and encourage them to download the MyShake app. Uh, through community outreach, you'll see some pictures there. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, the timeline was from June 2021 and initially it was until the end of December of um, 2022. But we ran into a lot of struggles there, uh, not just to tell you all the good things that happened with it, but also the struggles. We had COVID. We all remember that. It wasn't too long ago, and it kind of shut us down twice from being able to do outreach. 
So our engagement coordinators would go out to sites handing out food and try to, in those drive-through food uh, distributions and try to encourage people to down, download the MyShake app. Definitely a difficult time to really engage people out in the community uh, and trying to encourage them to download a, a, an app for earthquakes. Uh, so we extended it until March 31st, 2023, in which we were able to do more outreach and connect those in the community. Um, from a staffing perspective, we had one program manager overlooking this with three emergency engagement coordinators. Those coordinators were the people actually out in the community doing tabling events, talking with the community, encouraging them to download the MyShake app. And we had, um, at first we had two subgrantees and we kind of had to change things up because one of the subgrantees were not uh, doing engagement because of COVID, they weren't going out into the community. So we kind of had to change things up and the subgrantee we, we still had on the project was El Sol neighborhood. It's actually education center. I think I just had engagements on my mind because that was the goal uh, of this, but it was El Sol neighborhood um, education center. And what they did is they, they have CHWs that go directly out into the community and share, and they could educate people on the MyShake app. So we worked closely with them to connect to the community. Um, next slide, please. So as you can see, these are just pictures. I wanted to share this with all of you, just so you can see kind of what that looks like on the ground, uh, what it looks like out in the community. Uh, you can see we went, if you look at the image on the left, we went at night, we went on weekends, we went throughout the week to different events to try to really encourage people to download the MyShake app. If you look at the middle, one of the ways that we did that, that picture there, that person holding a 72 hour emergency kit. So we used that as kind of an incentive as they would come up to it and we would raffle off those um, emergency kits uh, once a month. And what they would have to do to get those emergency kits, they had to show us that they downloaded the app. So they would come to our table, show us you downloaded the app, put their name on a raffle ticket, and then at the end of the month, we would pull those, and we went and delivered it to the winners, and that's a picture of somebody who did uh, win one of those uh, backpacks or those emergency kits. On the right, you can see we also went to schools. So that is, um, I'm going to butcher the name, but Takez High School, and that's us doing an outreach with the youth at the high school. That's one of our engagement coordinators named Loreto. And then if you see the sign to the, to the right of her there, left on our screen, you can actually walk up and just scan the QR code and it'll take you directly to where you can download and get information on the MyShake app. So they would come up to these tables. We had different marketing materials such as hand sanitizer. We used first aid kits, flashlights. So we really had things that would draw people to those tables. And over the time period of the project, we actually did outreach at 549 different events in both, uh, or just in Riverside County. So as you can see, quite a bit of work going into getting those engagements. If you turn to the next slide, please. We also did a, um, a billboard and you would drive through Riverside County, one close, if you know Riverside County, California Baptist University down the street, from there, there was the MyShake app that would be there. And it was how Rivco gets earthquake warnings. And it had both of our images on the right and the left. Uh, but it would show to download the MyShake app, telling them to go to Google Play Store or to the, the Apple Store. And they can actually download that. This was popped up all over the place in Riverside County. We used quite a bit of billboards. And this was the exact billboard that they would see driving down the freeways, driving down the streets. So it was pretty cool to see those billboards posted throughout Riverside County. Next slide. Now this screen here is just to talk more about how we did and collected and tracked those engagements. So you might say, well, 70,000 engagements, how did you really track it, especially with subgrantees? How do you know how many they did? What we did is we would have them go in, we created a like kind of a survey form on our website. And what they would do is they would go in and name the activity or the event. And this was all the data we would collect to report on to Cal OES. So it'd be the name of the activity, the date of the event, uh, which organization it was, because it was either our organization or El Sol. And then we would put what zip codes they were in, what, how many people did they actually engage with at those places. So we were able to track each event and having them go in and fill that out after each event and actually get that total in the end. So if we jump to the next slide, and so this is the program outcomes, and I believe this is our last slide, 
but really looking at our goal was 70,000, which we did hit. I think we hit it by November. Um, so it was prior to the, the extension there. And we actually in the end did 95,000 engagements um, in Riverside County with the goal being 70,000. So we really engaged 25,000 more people than uh, what was initially required on the, on the grant. And if you look at this, you can see summer months were really the busy months for us. Um, after we had the early slow months, which was COVID, we got shut down again, I think January, February time period. And then we were really able to pick up over the summer and be able to do some of those outreach events and connect with the community there. Um, so that is just kind of like a timeline. So you can see those engagements and you can see there were quite a bit of engagements. I think it's showing 16,000 engagements there just in July of 2022. So uh, really peak times of engagements were during those summer months. And that is what we did on our end for education and outreach for the MyShake app. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we will now take our a couple minutes for discussion. Uh, we we're going to save them for the end, but the deputy director has something to say. <laughs> I, I did. That was a great deputy report, director. and my hats off to all of the work that you all have done. I'm going to take you back to your reference to the PSPS and the AFN community. We've been talking extensively, um, have a council, quite honestly, to work with utilities about PSPS with the AFN community, and. Their discussions with us have been that uh, they're um, having a, um, a challenge in getting people to sign up so that they can uh, know where they are and, and reach out to them in ways um, that they can get the notifications. I, I'm interested in knowing if you're having that same challenge. They're talking to us about um, folks being reluctant to sign up just because of giving the notification that they have a, med a medical uh, need or disability? I think there is a reluctancy there um, on the end of those who wanting to really sign up for that. Uh, and you see a lot of, I mean, AFN really covers a really broad range of people. Absolutely. I think it's about 80% of people. Uh, and we see it within our community, right? We have people that are, because it's primarily done through phone outreach on our end. So we're talking to them over the phone. And I think one of the things is, is that their initial need um, when they're calling into 211 is to address something that's immediate, right? So their immediate need first. And then we try to work with them with needs further down the road, which is you know getting them prepared for um, earthquakes or getting them prepared for power outages, those type of things. So I would say that the initially that it does take some time also to get them prepared on signing up for that. Uh, it could be a two or three step process in getting them enrolled into such a program. So we get a lot of people who say, yes, they want to be a part of the program. But then when you follow up, it's, I think it's my <laughs> majorly a struggle to get them to follow up and do those applications because uh, it can take several conversations with them to get them enrolled to, into it. It's not just a one call, finish and done. It's several conversations, emailing them their plan or even mailing them their plan if they don't have an email um, to some of, some of the population. So there's a struggle because it takes um, more than one step to do so. Hopefully that answered your question. Yes, thanks, Chris. Chris, this is Lori. I want to thank you for your partnership because those numbers that you, uh, engagements that you shared is far beyond anything that our um, little but mighty earthquake early warning unit here at Cal OES could have done. So having that trusted partner going into the communities is just invaluable. So my question to you is, um, as, we, as we start to explore other community-based partners, what gem or word of wisdom um, would you provide? What, what's the best way to get people to download the app and um, kind of internalize or want to learn more about how to be prepared for earthquakes? I think the, the thing that we've learned out there, uh, especially doing it, is first of all, showing them um, those steps, because a lot of times we'll have that initial conversation. Are you prepared 
uh, for an earthquake? And uh, you wouldn't imagine how many people say yes until you really have that conversation with them about um, what's needed to be prepared for an earthquake. So, un you know, really training them and educating them on how to be prepared for an earthquake, what's really needed uh, is probably the most important thing that we've learned from it. Uh, and then also, there has to be a draw to get them to engage with you, right? It's, you, you wanna make sure you're able to give something back to them when they come to you. Uh, so to draw people to our, our tabling events, it was those incentives. Uh, that's why I put it on here. It was such a big draw to have something at your table to actually get people to engage with you. Um, if it was just flyers, we probably wouldn't have seen as many people coming to our tables. Uh, and we try to make it fun for them. So having a spin wheel where they spin and it tells them which, uh, you know, which item they win. And at, during that time, you're able to educate them as well as talking to the parents and having maybe somebody playing with one of the, the kids as they're at those tables and educating the parents on what it takes to be prepared for an earthquake. So that, I guess there's those lessons learned on how to draw people. And then also the knowledge base of it is some people do think they're prepared for an earthquake when they may not be. Hey, Chris, I have a question. This is Jose with Cal OES. Could you talk a little bit more about the population that you serve, you served with the events um, that, that you guys put on? Yeah, so the goal was to really focus on some of the, the underserved communities. So we really went to some of the underserved communities, maybe out in some of the rural areas. Uh, so we wanted to make sure we were targeting some of those. Uh, so the different high schools, the different community events that are just at parks, those type of things. So, you know, community, uh, I guess you would call it engagement centers or community resource centers that we have in our area, uh, which are operated kind of for families would kind of drop in and, and, uh, and also operated at times by first five, those type of programs, we would want to be at those locations. Um, so we were at a lot of those, uh, but we also attended events just where, um, people normally wouldn't expect kind of an, an education or outreach position to be. So we attended a, a, something called like a tamale festival. We went to some of the, what was it? The lunar festival in Riverside. So that way we can target some of the, the underserved communities or some that normally wouldn't even um, have knowledge on the MyShake app. So we went to some of those events that kind of outside of the, the normal scope of where people would be from, from the social services um, spectrum. So that's kind of what we did. Our target was to really get to those communities that may not have heard of, heard of the MyShake app. Thank you, Chris, uh, if you don't mind, I'd like you to stay on the line if you can. We're going to go through a few more of the education outreach presentations, and we're going to open up for public comment at the end, if you don't mind. Yeah, of course. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Deputy Director Lori Najur. Thank you. So I get the privilege of speaking to some uh, big initiatives that are getting ready to be kicked off because John, um, who is our senior over outreach and education, unfortunately was unable to be here today. Unfortunate for him because these are his babies and uh, I hope I do them justice. So one of the big um, initiatives that or partnerships that we're working on right now is a partnership with the San Jose Quakes, the MLS team down in San Jose. And slides are coming up. So uh, John's been working with uh, KP Affairs, our, our public relations um, contractor, uh, on, an, on a partnership with the enterprise. It'll be a one-year pilot program. Uh, we are getting closer to the end of the year, uh, the end of this, uh, excuse me, soccer season, but we'll still be able to um, uh, be at several of their home events. We'll have access to 18,000 fans on match nights. Um, we'll bring along our shake simulator. We've been using that quite a bit. Um, as Chris mentioned, that's kind of the catch, right? You, we put it right out in front of the stadium. In fact, the stadium itself has kind of this um, ante area where before you enter the stadium proper, um, where they have booths and um, other um, demonstrators. And so we'll put the shake simulator there. We'll get to talk to folks um, as they're going into or coming out of the simulator. 
Um, we'll have an education day with the CEO and the team. Um, there will be multiple uh, billboard signage opportunities, PA, radio ads, uh, social media um, that'll be part of this initiative. Um, and one of the things that uh, we were really looking forward to is we actually get to use some of their players um, in uh, developing these videos, these PSAs um, in support of MyShake downloads. Next slide. So, um, you know, one of our goals is to educate and encourage um, these uh, attendees at the games to download the MyShake app to become more earthquake prepared. Um, they also have, as part of the uh, the enterprise itself, a um, a business organization or a business group. Um, that we would have access to. So um, getting information about earthquake early warning and automated actions to these various um, businesses uh, in and around the Bay Area um, will be fantastic. And then kind of the overarching goal is to walk away from this pilot with this model that we can then use with other public venues, sports teams in California, et cetera. Um, like like uh, Lori Pepper said, um, have that you know find develop these things and then scale them. Just let it go, and the the sky's the limit with this particular pilot. So we're really excited about that. Next slide. And another initiative that's still under development, but uh, within the next couple of months, hopefully will come out, is our Earthquake Early Warning Quake Safe Cities campaign. And we're kind of modeling it like um, you might have seen some uh, climate collaboratives before where people sign on to um, make sure that their cities are um, climate uh, friendly, it's a climate pledge. Well, we're looking to do the same. And um, we, we hope to get mayors to commit to actions to make their cities earthquake prepared, things like downloading the MyShake app, um, doing social media for us, um, maybe even exploring implementation in city buildings and other facilities. Um, things like that. Create, we'll have a web page that we're in the process of creating at earthquake.ca.gov. And um, we'll, each time we get a new city to sign on to our initiative, we'll put their um, city seal up on the website and we'll ask them for quotes and, and we'll follow their social media and um, we'll see how big this can get. So each and every one of you that's in a different city, um, start talking to your city leadership. Let's see uh, if we can get them on board early on in this initiative. Thank you, Lori. And with that, we'll now transition to our administrative analyst, Samantha Lane, to discuss some of the recent outreach events. All right, good afternoon. Education and outreach continues to be an important component of earthquake early warning, addressing high risk and underserved communities statewide through public outreach. Since the last advisory board, Cal OES has participated in numerous high profile outreach events, including the 1906 San Francisco earthquake anniversary event and first Thursday at UCLA. Leveraging existing events in the community provides the program the opportunity to take advantage of participating in an event by the community for the community. This provides us a great advantage by working with trusted partners and community leaders throughout the state to amplify the message of earthquake early warning to all from a trusted messenger. Each event includes the earthquake simulator and a booth with earthquake preparedness materials. Specific to the event at UCLA that you see up on the screen, the earthquake simulator and outreach booth were displayed on campus at Wilson Plaza, a highly trafficked area centered around athletic facilities and activity centers. This was the rare outreach event that focused primarily on engaging with college age students in an earthquake prone part of the state and within one of the largest media markets. 
The majority of visitors were students between the ages of 18 to 24, but also included engineering professionals, emergency personnel, professors, and international tourists. More than 100 people alone rode the simulator, providing riders the opportunity to experience simulated shaking intensity similar to that caused by a magnitude 7.0 earthquake. We've also participated in outreach events in Pomona, Inglewood, San Francisco, Bakersfield, and Wilmington, along with upcoming multi-day events at the National CERT Conference and Fleet Weeks in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and San Diego. Those events are in response to the highly successful statewide six city tour in October in advance of the Great California Shakeout Drill. In addition to strengthening community preparedness and building new partnerships with city and county emergency managers, Cal OES has received public comments on how to expand community outreach. Of note, Jennifer Dutton from the UCLA Health Office of Emergency Preparedness asked that safety flyers be made available specifically for persons with wheelchairs. We saw this request as an opportunity to fill a much needed gap. Also, Nyla Cancino from the city of Pomona was encouraged about the possibility of Cal OES sending toolkits and fact sheets to different sectors within our county. Within our county. This is in part due to the willingness of the city of Pomona to partner with earthquake early warning and promote the program within different businesses in their city. After all, everyone benefits from earthquake preparedness. The strategy continues to be a steady drumbeat of events throughout the year, very much in line with the board's suggestion from the last meeting. This strategy has proven to be effective. And coupled with the earned media strategy post earthquakes, we feel that we are reaching a very diverse set of people throughout all of California. As always, it is important to us to make our education and outreach people focused with emphasis on high risk populations and underserved communities so that earthquake early warning comes to all of those living in California. So you can go to the next slide. So as we move to discussion, um, you consider the question up here. Outside of funding, what incentives exist to encourage participation in the EEW Quake Safe Cities project and what can be done within your sector to encourage participation? Thank you, Samantha, Chris, and Lori. That concludes the presentations for the education and outreach overview. We'll now move to discussion. Chief Deputy Director Curry, do you have any opening comments? Thank you. With that, we'll move to the board members. Uh, if you wish to ask a question or provide comment in the room or virtually, please unmute yourself at this time or raise your hand. I see Lori Pepper. Thank you. Um, I think this Quake Safe Cities project is um, looks uh, really exciting and, and lots of potential. Um, I know when we're trying to reach uh, cities, we go to the Association of California Cities and even CSAC, and they have committees and usually help us figure out which one to present to. So already on the ball there so never mind we know <laughs> that thank you for bringing that up because i forgot to mention it in my presentation we have had conversations with uh league of california cities right. so um they're on board want to help us out great Lori and Lori, any other comments okay We'll now move to public comment at this point and open up discussion for any public comment. All comments will be limited to three minutes per person. Should you like to comment, please indicate so in the Q&A section or by utilizing the raised hand function of the video conference and the moderator will unmute you. All right, we'll now move into the system operations update section of the meeting. Next up will be a presentation from Bob DeGroote, who is the USGS Coordinator for Communication, Education, Outreach, and Technical Engagement, and the Chair for the USGS Shake Alert Joint Committee for Communication, Education, Outreach, and Technical Engagement. He will discuss updates to Shake Alert's license to operate process and the technical industry engagement strategy. 
and I will follow Bob's presentation with an update on EW system operations. Bob, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks so much, Derek. Uh, you can go ahead to the next slide, please. I know that we're uh, moving closer to really knowing a world where uh, there is a thriving, successful, interconnected web of big and small businesses, hospitals, transportation systems that can grow and extend where eventually everyone will use or is impacted by earthquake early warning. And I wanted to, to show this slide just to give a general sense of the shake alert system because we are very reliant on uh, the folks on the right. Of course, so many organizations and people have contributed to the operation side of detecting the earthquakes, processing that, of course, build out of the seismic sensors across the state of California, uh, supported by, by Cal OES, uh, has, has, we're getting closer and closer to completing that build out by the end of 2025. Um, one thing that, of course, on, on the far right is that we're dependent on these third party organizations to uh, be able to deliver, produce and deliver Shakler powered products and services. And so uh, we, are, we are moving in the direction of trying to find ways to build that out. And this is sort of the core of what I'm gonna be talking about today. What I'd also first like to talk a little bit about is the connection between uh, the earthquake detection and information processing, producing the shake alert message, which ultimately gets turned into alerts, um, the interface between that and the third party folks. And the next slide shows our, our technical implementation uh, and engagement team across three states. So of course, uh, one thing we've been talking today are about efforts in California, but the shake alert system actually serves 50 million people across California, Oregon, and Washington. And of course, uh, there is an early warning system that is emerging in, in Canada, both on the East Coast and the West Coast uh, about a year from now. So of course, there's close coordination with them as well in terms of messaging and, and making sure that people across borders know, know what to do. Uh, this team is, is fantastic. Of course, they represent people from three states, uh, but they're also operating across borders because there are several companies that we're working with that have a presence uh, in all three states. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of work to be done. So this is a group of approximately, well, including me, uh, an additional five people. Um, I'm really, some really good news though, is that we're in the process of hiring uh, two new assistant coordinators that will be working with me in, on the USGS side. One person who will be based out of Moffett Field here in, in Northern California, and then another person who will be based uh, at, in Seattle at the University of Washington. Next slide, please. So what I'm showing here are, are, are key five sectors that we've been really focusing on over the last so many years, four or five years now, and, and trying to get Shakler power products and services into these environments. And we've been successful in many cases, and I'll show a couple of examples uh, here in a bit. And of course, this is what we're looking for is expansion. Again, this is where I'm gonna end up today with my presentation in terms of what we're doing. Um, our goal is to build an earthquake early warning industry uh, to something that where we can realize this is where it's in everybody's hands. It becomes a part of everyday life. Next slide, please. So just some highlights uh, from some of the projects that we've, we've been working on recently. And uh, one of the highlights is that Shakler expansion uh, to all seven passenger lines of Metrolink. Uh, this, is, uh, this was a big, big thing. Um, positive train control has been a big deal in, in, the, in the train industry for some years, but essentially what was developed is, a, is a, uh, an interface between the shake alert system and positive train control. It's called the commuter railway seismic interface. And that was a, a big development project that actually took years to produce. And now there is enforced stopping on all seven lines. Now, while it's not California, we did have an implementation. Our, our newest LTO is at, at Allen Institute, Allen Science Institute in Seattle, uh, where the, um, the laboratories are outfitted uh, with uh, alerting capabilities. Uh, one very big challenge in this environment, of course, well, not of course, you wouldn't know that, but an interesting thing about this lab is they make use of optical tables. So they cannot actually anchor uh, systems to the walls. They have to be floating. So imagine the, the room starts to shake and basically you have these devices that are just floating like on basically on balloons and we need to sort of work and, and figure out what they can do. Uh, this is actually going to have implementation or excuse me, it's going to have uh, implications rather for, for other laboratory environments in the future. 
Uh, we have several active pilot projects in process. Uh, of course, there's a distinction here. Uh, licensed operators or LTOs are capable of uh, selling or distributing shake alert powered products and services. They're actually licensed by the USGS to do this. In fact, any project that comes through through our, our, you know, in terms of implementation, has to undergo the licensing process and the testing and making sure that what they what they say they can do, they can do. And also the education and training is is up to stuff, making sure that proper protective actions are being are being uh, implemented. A couple of highlights from the standpoint of, of, of PLAs that are out there, there are about 14 or 15. The number changes a little bit from day to day based on new people coming through the pipeline. The Jet Propulsion Laboratory is actually doing an on-site implementation at their lab in Pasadena for protecting equipment for people and, and other facilities on, on that campus uh, in, in, in Pasadena. And then the second site that JPL is doing an implementation is the Goldstone a Goldstone radio antenna, which is one of three that basically is the communication system between anything that's out there in space and Earth. Um, the one of three antennas, the other two in Canberra, uh, Australia, and the second in, in Madrid, and the third, of course, at Goldstone uh, near Barstow. Uh, and the last uh, example I'll just share really quickly here is the use of uh, uh, protecting uh, water supplies uh, in, in Oregon by eWeb, potentially applicable to California. There are a lot of, there's a lot of growth in the uh, education and training area, uh, or excuse me, the, in the schools uh, for with, with Shake Alert. And also we're, we're building a very close working relationship. We're continuing to work closely with Cal OES. Next slide. So this is just a list uh, on our, on our uh, homepage, shakealert.org. There is a, a basically a, um, a list of our 12 LTOs. And uh, at the bottom of that page, there's a, there's a link to a much more detailed list of the LTOs and what they're capable of, hosted by one of our partners at the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network up in Seattle, and actually in Oregon as well. Next slide. Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, we're also doing a lot of social science research connected with uh, with technical engagement. And a key piece here I think that's important is that we're always being asked the question, well, how is this gonna benefit us? What are the benefits? And I think something may, we may have learned today from conversations is that there's this area of counterfactual thinking, which I won't go into a lot of detail because I know my time is very limited. But the point here is, is that we um, are trying to find ways to express the value of bringing uh, earthquake early warning into various environments. And uh, this is a research project that's actually being conducted by um, Professor Yolanda Lin at the University of New Mexico, working directly with our technical partners to, to really ascertain these things. And I think one of the sort of side benefits of when a company or organization decides to implement a shake alert in their environment, there's this whole idea of, of, well, while we're doing this, we might as well do something else to protect ourselves. Have we done a drill recently? Or have we you know, updated our kits? Those kinds of things. Next slide, please. And this is the, this is the core of, of what I wanted to talk about today is the Technical Industry uh, Engagement Strategy Project, or TIES. And so one of the areas that we're very interested in is really um, having an opportunity to, to take things to the next level. And this gets back to one of the earlier slides about building the earthquake early warning industry. Uh, we want to invest in our team members and future team members in really um, understanding what it takes to infiltrate and to really be successful in certain sectors. Uh, there are areas that are, you know, talking with people about really good ideas is one thing, and we do a lot of that, but how do we seal the deal? How do we get them to actually do it? And how do, do, do we actually get them to do it in a way that's practical and feasible? And so we've hired a company based out of Southern California called Constant Associates, um, they're based in Torrance. And uh, what we're doing are three things. We're developing a strategy where basically how do we do a deep dive into these, into these industries, into these sectors. So the five sectors that I, um, I included in um, in, in the earlier slide, but also the additional uh, sectors that are in uh, Presidential Priority Directive 21, which is listed on there, which is an expansion of those sectors. And many of the sectors that were mentioned earlier, of course, are included on that list. 
Um, what we want to do is the strategy is going to take us out to 2026. So we're in addition to the strategy is, of course, what are we going to do? The action plan. Um, our team admitted to me that, well, they're not marketers. So how do they actually go about, you know, actually pushing this forward in a way that's practical and that they can they can do a good job with it? The third component is a is a, a, a toolkit that will develop additional resources that we may have not have developed uh, to date. Uh, this is going to be up to a three-year project. We funded years one and two already. Year one is, of course, already in, in, in motion. Year two is being funded out of current fiscal year resources from uh, for my budget for, for the project. And one thing I also want to feature here, too, is that this is not being done in a, in a vacuum. Uh, we actually have formed what we call a focus team. This is within sort of our larger uh, strategic effort to include uh, folks from all three Shake Alert states to be involved in providing some oversight, feedback, uh, just basically helping us get the, get the program to where it needs to be and, and make sure that the resources that are developed are useful. And so we've included members from, from of course, all three states from our technical engagement team. Uh, from Cal OES, we have Megan Sullivan involved with the group who will be joining us for the, for the focus team. And also I think some of you probably all, all know and remember uh, uh, Alistair Hayden, uh, who uh, is, is now at Cornell University as a professor of practice, he will be joining the group as well. So we're, as again, we're trying to, to, to garner uh, uh, participation across the board. And so um, what we wanna do is uh, make sure that if we go to the, through, through this program, uh, this project, we're gonna be able to uh, continue to build out our, our technical partner base, which is the major goal of this. Next slide, please. And I think that's the last one. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? Thank you, Bob. Uh, right now, we'll open it up for discussion. Uh, Chief Deputy Director, any questions? And open to the board members. Uh, Jack. Yeah, hi. Quick question on these pilot programs. I noticed you, I think you listed 14. I was curious to know if you had off if you had a pilot program working with a major building contractor in terms of of early warning uh, while workers are on the job site. Uh, I so the, the ones that we currently have going, I, I, I'm not aware of one that's 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 current, but we're certainly open to talking to people about it. Okay, any other questions? Oh, Jose? Yeah, so Bob, so thank you so much for the presentation. Um, and I know this is early, uh, too early for, for us to kind of um, ask you about, but I think that in the future, for future presentations, we're gonna be really interested to see how the engagement piece for, um, for, the, for the ties group. Um, and I know that's a very difficult thing to do, having, you know, being on the same um, bus with you on that, but that's gonna be really a focus um, um, for us of how we are gonna be able to listen more um, PLAs, um, put more PLAs in the pipeline, um, not only for the engagement piece, but also for the continuous streamlining of the PLA LTO process. Absolutely, and so the first, of course, we've had the kickoff meetings with Constant already, and, and my team lead for this project uh, is Tal Edgecombe at the University of California, Berkeley. She's, uh, she's sort of leading the, leading the group that's this, this focus team. And uh, one of the first tasks is development of project management plan. So certainly you'll have access to that to see where we're taking the project. Um, of course, uh, it's gonna take a while to get ramped up in a way that we can actually implement some of these things. I'm, tr we're trying to set up the, I don't wanna get into a situation where we wait a year and like, oh, now we can start, you know, and that's not what we wanna do. We actually wanna be able to do things right out of the gate. So I'm, I'm certain there may be sort of a, um, actionable things, as I think what you're referring to, Jose, um, that we can we can jump into immediately and and really get things moving. Uh, this is going to be a learning process. Uh, again, we've never done anything like this before, and I think even our contractor is like, "Wow, um, this is interesting and this is very new." So we'll we'll see where it goes. Okay. Was there a question? Yes. Thanks, Jose. Bob, um, so you've heard like all the things that we're working on with outreach, research and development uh, initiatives, things like that. And um, our goal is 
is really to try to get people into implementation uh, of automated actions. And a lot of that will be connecting them with the vendors that are already LTOs. Um, but in some cases, you know, it'll be they'll have proprietary systems and they'll want to pursue the LTO themselves. So um, my question to you is um, this ties group, is that really where we can bring um, the information about these folks that have expressed interest um, to you? Or is it is it more of a, you know, a, a personal relationship where we just pick pick up the phone? maybe have regular meetings with you. We've got to figure out a way if, if we're going to be bringing in all of these folks that want to explore the possibility of automated actions, um, we, we don't want uh, you know, them to get uh, jammed up because uh, the more time it takes for them to get started, they'll lose interest and, and drop out. Um, so any suggestions on how we can um, create that pipeline between what we're doing here at Cal OES and uh, getting them through LTOs if that ends up being yeah. a path? That's a really good question. And and yeah, we need to talk some more about this. I think there, there is, you know, of course, I've really enjoyed working with Derek and, and the team. And and I know that that um, we, we have a good working relationship. So I think we can start talking about pathways of implementation. I really think that there's going to be it's a very it's a it's a very iterative process in terms of the you know getting people who are interested and let's get going and let's get them go through the process. Yes, we can certainly we have the pipeline for that and we can customize things from the Cal OES and and then jumping into the the licensing side with the USGS. Um, we can do that um, as as we learn about ways to get into these other sectors. Then of course we want. Megan and others to take the knowledge back to Cal OES to say, hey, let's try this. <laughs> so I think that we, we just, I, 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 I'm, I'm always happy to talk more and, and do more uh, to make it happen. So I think it's, I, I think it's very doable. I think we already have a pretty good way of, of, of working together. So I think it'll be fine. And of course, I, I think regular meetings potentially uh, to discuss uh, potential areas where there are, um, where it appears to be sort of things are getting jammed up a little bit. Um, we just need to be very honest with one another about sort of snags and let's just try to fix them. And I'm very encouraged by us staffing up. Um, I, I, we doing it for about seven years on my own. We had somebody for a while, but she moved on to another position at the Department of Energy. And um, so hopefully we'll have these folks on board here soon. So we'll have more people to work with us. So thank you for your question. I can say just one quick follow up. Um, I do think it would be wise um, for us to um, make our, our our contractor KP Affairs available because they have kind of taken on this piece of implementation um, for us. And I do think that there may be some lessons learned that we are able to pass on um, to to the ties group and particularly constant associates. So. Right, and and when it when it comes to licensing as well, I think that we do have resources at in at our headquarters in Reston to to talk about license agreements and and technical performance guidelines and what constitutes success. And I think knowing what's needed, and maybe you're talking about something slightly different, Jose, but knowing what's needed right from the beginning, which we try to do with our our potential pilots, is is critical so that we don't set them up for failure uh, far down the line. So. Yeah. Sorry, I was really more focused on the engagement piece. Oh yes, is, okay. Yeah, so that, I think the pardon the, me, our, I'm sorry. Yeah, yes, but but okay. I but, but I see what you're saying. So yeah, I think there'll be some. I think there's some natural um, lessons learned that we could kind of provide. Absolutely, yes. This yeah. a follow up for me too. Um, so as I think about like our airport um, feasibility study and other sectors and, and your, the, your priority sectors and our priority sectors, they align, you know, very, very absolutely. Um, we're going to need more vendors, right. To create the shake alert powered products. And um, so that there's a solicitation that has to occur there too. And I'm, I'm not a business person, um, but when we, you know, when we do our feasibility study and we see these um, potentials, how? Well, I'm just going to throw it out there. Maybe, maybe we can work together on on going out into the business community and trying to find people to create these products, right? I mean, I don't, I don't want to cross any lines that I'm not supposed to as a state agency um, personnel, but. Um, 
I'm very interested in exploring that possibility yeah. with you too. And this is really where where ties is going to inform us uh, in this area because we have the existing LTOs that have devices that can do multiple things and they're allowed to do certain things under their statement of work. Um, or if they realize a new opportunity, they can develop something new and, and to, to, to meet this need. So there are a lot of ways to do this. So I, I don't have all the answers, but I think that uh, we'll have some good strategies from this group, but also um, I think we may be able to do some things in the meantime. I'm, I'm, I'm not a person who like just, just likes to sit around. I don't want to get going. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do. But I just, I just enjoy the fact that we're continuing to talk. So thank you. Okay. Uh, with that, we'll move to public comment. Uh, at this point, we'll open up discussion for any public comment. All comments will be limited to three minutes per person. Should you like to comment, please indicate so in the Q&A section or by utilizing the raise hand function of the video conference and the moderator will unmute you. Okay, seeing none, we'll transition to the system, update, system ops updates from EEW. Thank you, Bob. Okay, uh, I'll now discuss the updates to system ops as it pertains to seismic build out. As mentioned before, with the continued development and nearly completed build out of the Q system, we are looking toward operations and maintenance with a focus on refurbishing and upgrading outdated stations as we continue to connect to the state microwave. California Earthquake Early Warning System network of contributing stations has increased to 937 out of the goal of 1,115 stations, which is roughly around 84% complete, and an increase of 25 stations since our last meeting in November. Next slide, please. Cal OES and our partners have completed 600 out of the 702 planned queues funded EEW stations, an increase of 68 stations since November 22. There are a remaining 102 stations pending completion. Cal OES Public Safety Communications continues to work to connect EEW stations into the state microwave network and secure tower and vault leases. Nine additional EEW stations online and connected to the state microwave system for a total of 94 out of 350 stations, roughly 26% complete with 256 remaining. That concludes the presentations for system ops, but we would like to open the floor again to the advisory board for any discussion regarding uh, the topics presented. Back with you, Chief Deputy Director, any comments? And again, to the board. All right. Um, and again, we will open it up for public comment uh, with three minutes per person. Please raise your hand or use the Q&A section to indicate that you have a comment or question. Right, we will now return the floor back to our Deputy Director, Lori Najur, to provide an update on EEW's financial picture. Lori. So um, most of you will remember that this year, this uh, current budget year, we are on our first year of ongoing general fund for the Earthquake Early Warning Program, uh, which was uh, just a great move um, for us because instead of having one year at a time, um, now we can, we can expect ongoing funding. So currently we're in the process of getting all of our 2022-23 spending plan contracts uh, executed before the end of the year. Um, that will equate to, um, well, we have $17.1 million ongoing general fund uh, that covers administrative, um, 
the administrative part of it. It covers the system build out um, or maintenance and operation as we're now transitioning, as you heard Derek say. Um, it also funds our outreach and education and our research and development. Um, so here you have, uh, and we've talked today about some of the items that are being funded through the 2022-23 spending plan. Now that we have ongoing funding, um, our, our goal is to in, do two-year spending plans instead of just annual. Um, so that way, when we undertake some of these longer, more detailed projects, we can do so. And um, it also gives our partners who are working on the, the system ops uh, just that continuity and um, helps them because a lot of the costs are personnel costs for uh, conducting the maintenance, the operations, doing the research and development, et cetera. So um, having the longer term funding plan in place will be more beneficial for them as well. Um, it, and it'll be more e efficient um, for us because putting a spending plan together, an annual spending plan sure takes a, a lot of time that we could be doing other things um, like the, the implementation projects that you've heard about today. So um, that's kind of the long and short of it. Uh, any questions about um, the funding for the program? All right, seeing no hands or any comments, we will uh, now move to public comment for the finance portion. Do we have any public comments or questions online. Okay, hearing none, we will now move to closing statements and public comment. Uh, Chief Deputy Director Curry, would you like to close us out? Sure thing, thanks Derek. Um, Nancy had to step away, but, um, but just sends her appreciation for all the great presentations. And I too wanna thank um, public Television, USGS, United Way, Transportation, and Caltrans um, for um, in our OES team just for giving us a glimpse of all the good work that's underway. It's very exciting um, to see not only um, the continued success of the program that is in place with these events that we're having and, and seeing the, the greater and greater public uptake, but also um, all the possibilities uh, that we're starting to broach with the automated actions and um, and uh, you know, kind of like uh, taking it to that next level to really see where this can go. There's always more that can be done. We always wish it could be quicker, but certainly, you know, kind of doing it the right way um, to gain uh, more and more traction on this is is what we're effort towards that. To the members of the board, cannot thank you enough. This is a big chunk of your day to spend time with us here in person and online. So we really appreciate it. Your expertise is invaluable, especially as we continue to build on the momentum on this program. So just appreciate that. I hope this has been food for thought and your, your ideas are, are uh, flowing of, of even more that we could do. So please send those along. Doesn't have to wait until these meetings, but as we go, if you have ideas, um, if there's things that we could do be, to, to, to be better, please, um, please send that to us. And we look forward to hearing about even more uh, that we've accomplished at the next time we meet. So thank you all. Thank you, Chief Deputy Curry. Uh, do any board members wish to ask any final questions or provide comment? And now you may unmute yourself at this time. At this point, we will open up discussion for any public comment. All comments should be limited to three minutes per person. Should you like to comment, please indicate so in the Q&A section or by utilizing the raise hand function of the video conference and the moderator will unmute you. With that, um, Deputy Director, any additional remarks? Okay. Uh, with that, we can entertain a motion to adjourn. Would anyone like to motion? So moved. And a second? Second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. We are adjourned.